Well, I'd like to welcome our participants that have joined us so far today to the Antimicrobial Stewardship Project webinar series. This series was created by the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. Uh, this is otherwise known as SIDRAP ASP. I am Marnie Peterson, and I'll be your moderator and host today. I'm the outreach coordinator for the project, and I've spent the last 20 years researching strategies to prevent antibiotic resistant infections. So to begin the webinar today, I'd like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Ed Septimus, for the presentation of our webinar titled, Value of Diagnostics to Enhance Antimicrobial Stewardship. And as he's noted there, this will be a case-based approach with additional polling questions throughout to engage with our participants to obtain data and, and their opinion. A little bit of background uh, about Ed Septimus. He received his medical degree from Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, where he also completed his postgraduate training in internal medicine and infectious diseases. He was the vice president of research and infectious diseases at a, I mean, excuse me, HCA Healthcare until 2018. Dr. Septimus has served on the board of directors of the Infectious Diseases Society of America and was on their Antimicrobial Resistance Committee and the Quality Measurement Committee. He's also served on the board of, for the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America, otherwise known as SHEA, on their Antimicrobial Stewardship Committee. Dr. Septimus is currently on the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's Antimicrobial Drugs Advisory Committee and is co-chair of the National Quality Forum's Patient Safety Steering Committee. He holds many faculty positions. He's a clinical professor at Texas A&M College of Medicine, serves as a senior lecturer in Harvard Medical School's Department of Population Medicine, and is a professor and distinguished senior fellow at the George Mason University School of Public Health. He has published more than 100 articles and chapters and has been awarded many teaching awards. So before I hand it over to Dr. Septimus, a few notes about uh, our continuing education activity today. We are pleased to offer one hour of contact hour of continuing pharmacy education through ProCE as part of our webinar. The CE activity has been supported by an educational grant from BioMaru. So to obtain your CE credit, there will be a post-test that will be available through the ProCE website there. And again, we will show you this information at the end of the presentation and we'll also have it available on our website. You'll be able to print your CE statement for completion of this online activity. And keep in mind that the deadline for registering your CE is June 14th, so approximately one month from now. The pharmacist will be able to upload their CE credit to the CPE monitor. And you'll need an attendance code to do this, and that will be provided at the end of this webinar. The polling questions will be available via the chat box at the lower right-hand corner, and we also encourage you to submit questions. There will be 15, approximately 15 minutes of Q&A at the end of this webinar, and we'll encourage you to provide comments questions for our speaker by that chat box and just please send it to all panelists. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Septimus and he'll begin his presentation today. Welcome. Well, welcome. It's a real honor to be part of this wonderful series on antimicrobial stewardship. Uh, my goals for today are going to be to talk, first of all, just in a very 30,000 foot view about antimicrobial stewardship. Uh, but I really want to focus our attention more on the concept of diagnostic stewardship and how important that is for antimicrobial stewardship. And it's not just the rapid molecular studies, which many of you probably are well aware, but it's also to talk about some basic microbiology, which is essential as the foundation of stewardship. Uh, talk about biomarkers such as procalcitonin as well, and we'll talk about the uses, advantages, and disadvantages of different types of some of the rapid diagnostic tests that are available, and it's a rapidly changing world. 
Um, so thank you very much for joining. I know you're all very busy. So as way of introduction, I think most of you know, I don't like to use the word crisis very often, but there is a, a, an upcoming crisis in infectious diseases driven by drug resistance, increasing number of patients who are immunosuppressed, who are living much longer. We know about emerging new pathogens, new mechanisms of resistance, uh, the reemergence uh, of older pathogens, uh, many of them multidrug resistant, such as tuberculosis. Uh, we know about decreasing new development. We've seen a little bit of uptick on that, but still well behind what we need. And then the whole concept of dysbiosis that is created by inappropriate and overuse of antimicrobial therapy, which as most of you know is the main pathogenesis of Clostridium difficile, but probably plays into other things in terms of their immune response. Now, conceptually, I really like this slide. For many of us who have been in infectious diseases since the 1970s, we know that antibiotics have really been miracle drugs that has allowed for transplantation and many other advances in healthcare. And with the, if we didn't have antibiotics, many of these advances would not be possible. And we used to think there was no downside risk because big pharma kept coming up with new drugs. However, we know that's not true anymore. And the new paradigm, which is shown on the right, uh, shows that antibiotics are good when they're used well, but better when they're used thoughtfully. And I know many of you out there have seen a lot of empiric use of antimicrobial agents that are not always as thoughtful as we'd like. We know the misuse causes resistance, C. diff infections. Uh, we know that 20% of inpatients have an adverse drug event. It increases cost, mortality. And we don't talk much about societal costs. We kind of focus on the inpatient side. The patients who survive their hospitalization often have significant morbidity and costs after they leave the hospital. Their quality of life and their productivity are clearly impacted by this. <clears throat> if we look at the global dimension, uh, this is a very sobering study that was done in the UK Wellcome Institute, showed that by 2050, There'll be 10 million deaths attributable to antimicrobial resistance each year. And I want you to look at the economic cost. That's well over $100 trillion. So very, very costly to society. Now, there's many definitions of antimicrobial stewardship by measuring prescribing, how to improve prescribing. I'm going to concentrate a lot of mine on misdiagnosis and delayed diagnosis that often lead to underuse and overuse of antibiotics. In fact, one of the biggest drivers of empiric overuse of antibiotics is diagnostic uncertainty, which is why I think the concept of diagnostic stewardship is so important. In the end, when we do identify the pathogen, we want to make sure it's the right drug at the right dose, the right duration. That's so important, and in the end, I really believe this is all about patient safety and the, the, delivering the best health care to our patients. So the goals far and away are improved patient outcomes, and we can accomplish those goals by appropriate selection, dose duration, I've already mentioned, reducing adverse events, reducing morbidity and mortality, hopefully reversing resistance, which will in turn reduce length of stay and reduce healthcare expenditures. And I know the folks in the C-suite sort of pay attention to those bottom bullets, but I can assure you if you pay attention to the top, the bottom two bullets are much, much easier to accomplish. Now, this slide came out of a wonderful project funded by AHRQ, a safety program for improving antimicrobial use. Uh, and it was published in JAMA earlier this year and it's the four moments of antibiotic decision-making. The first thing we have to ask ourselves, does the patient have an infection that requires an antibiotic? It seems like a simple question, but we really need to go back to basics. The next thing, again, which we're gonna emphasize on this broadcast is have I ordered appropriate cultures before I start antibiotics? Because if you don't recover the pathogen, it makes it much more difficult to de-escalate uh, and, and come up with appropriate durations then every day you should be asking the question, do the patient still need antibiotics? Does the pathogen occur? Can I narrow my spectrum? Is there an IV to oral 
opportunity. And then looking at duration of antimicrobial therapy for the syndrome in question, as we've learned from some very good studies, the duration of therapy for many common syndromes is much shorter than we thought 10 years ago. And so we want to link the diagnostics to the stewardship. Is the test appropriate? Will the clinical care of the patient be affected by the test results? And will the result be available in a time that can optimally affect care? And later on, we're going to be talking about how rapid diagnostics have the opportunity to inform antimicrobial use much more rapidly if they're linked to an action and stewardship. So we're going to start off on the left-hand side of this slide, a very nice review article in During Clinical Micro a couple of years ago. And first, we're going to talk about the diagnostic stewardship, the right test, the right patient, and the right time. And then later on in the broadcast, we'll talk about the rapid diagnostics. But I want to concentrate on the basics first. So the basic principles is that stewardship, to be successful, there has to be appropriate specimen collection. And that needs to be embraced by the medical staff. And by the way, the nursing staff has a really key role uh, in trying to make sure that specimens are collected appropriately. Does the culture have an indication? That sounds so basic, but this is especially true when we start talking about routine urine collections. Is the specimen appropriate? Uh, does the culture start before antibiotics whenever possible? And the other key thing, are they labeled appropriately? It's very frustrating to know that blood cultures are drawn, and when you look in the computer, you can't really tell whether this is a peripheral venipuncture site drawn from the central line with the two separate sticks. Very, very difficult. So labeling is really appropriate. We should have a mechanism in place to reject poor quality specimens. They may be sputums and urines in particular, and swab specimens, especially of superficial chronic draining wounds, really should be outlawed. It gives very misinformation. In terms of the, the role of labs and stewardship, things we have to ask ourselves, are the test results going to be in a format the physicians understand? Will the physicians modify their therapy based on the test results? Will they act promptly? How do we get that information to the physician in a timely manner so that it's actionable and both diagnostic and antimicrobial stewardship are really required to optimize the use of resources and outcomes. Now, from an historical perspective, and I, I like to think about this, look about where we were in the 1880s. We got the first cultivation of bacteria. Uh, Hans Graham, uh, one of my heroes, I have to tell you, invented the Gram stain in 1884. In fact, I still do some Gram stains myself, which petrifies the people in microbiology. Uh, and then the idea of, of actually cultivation, of course, was Petri, and we call that the Petri dish in 1887. If you think about it, we really didn't have much in advance of this up until the last 10 to 15 years. So the traditional methods where we did a history and physical, by the way, history is still critical uh, to decide if the patient's infected, whether it's viral, bacterial, could be parasitic, is the availability of a gram sting, which I'll talk about in a little while. Are we talking about a virus versus a bacteria? Uh, do I know my local antibiogram? And if I know I produce a local antibiogram, do I know where it is? How do I obtain that and use it in my decision making? Because that ultimately should help with decision making. How do I obtain appropriate cultures? We've got to ensure that these are consistently and appropriately collected, rapidly transported to the laboratory and labeled correctly, which I've already said in a previous slide. And here's some things that I developed uh, over the years for our house staff. That wounds, I, I really strongly recommend against doing swabs of superficial wounds. They're likely colonizing organisms. It doesn't necessarily correlate well with deep cultures. Prefer actual pus or tissue sample. From the surgical wound, we recommend that physicians, of course, try to obtain a culture prior to antibiotics, depending upon the patient's stability. And if available, to have wound care, perhaps do some cleaning and debridement, and then try to get a deep culture. I think swabs should be removed from the operating room for all intents and purposes. Blood cultures, generally separate venipuncture sites. If you do have to draw it through a catheter, generally speaking, you need to 
think that the catheter may be the source of bacteremia, and there's some ways to do this to cut down on contamination, but there is a higher contamination rate if you do it from catheters. And again, you've got to label the catheter, uh, excuse me, the specimens and the collection time and date. Uh, it's very important to make sure that gets entered in the computer correctly. Urines, uh, evaluating patient symptoms is much more important. Uh, do not order reflex urine. A lot of folks have asymptomatic bacteria, which unfortunately when, when it gets put in the computer as a positive culture, often will drive unnecessary antibiotics and all the unintended consequences. Uh, we actually have a mechanism in place, except in neutropenic and transplant patients, where we actually do a reflex. We make sure the patient at least has pyuria, and we hope the physician says the patient has symptoms also. Uh, before a urine is actually processed in the laboratory. A Clostridium difficile has been a very challenging area, not only in terms of increasing percentage and morbidity, uh, but also we found out there's some real stewardship around stools for Clostridium or Clostridioides difficile, that one, we should make sure we have at least three or more unformed stools of a Bristol 7 type. We found uh, not just in, in my healthcare system, but in multiple healthcare systems, that a lot of patients, uh, a Clostridioides difficile study is obtained, and up to 50% of patients may have actually been on laxatives in the prior 48 hours. And depending upon the diagnostic study you do, it may be difficult to differentiate colonization versus true infection. We'll come back and talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and, of course, testing to evaluate cure is not recommended, and as I've already stated, if you're using a PCR-type algorithm, it does not distinguish between colonization and infection, which is why appropriate selection of sending a specimen in the first place is so very, very important. Now, earlier this year, uh, the IDSA and the American Society for Microbiology uh, updated their guide to utilization of the microbiology lab for the diagnosis of infectious disease. This is a very comprehensive document. Uh, and what I boiled down is some highlights to correlate what I've already just hopefully convinced you is important. One is to reject, to reject poor quality specimen. Uh, number two is a very important one because we do have physicians still calling down to microbiology demanding that every organism be worked up. That's not appropriate. Specimens from mucosal, near mucosal sites, such as respiratory, sinuses, superficial wounds, fistulas, and other, you need to have a great deal of care and collection. I've already implied that you really need deep cultures and not swabs of superficial drainage. Uh, I prefer the laboratory to only set a specimen unless absolutely necessary. And if we do have a, a swab that needs to be obtained, we have special e-swabs that we use and not the old cotton swabs. A specimen should be collected prior to antibiotics, obviously, to optimize obtaining the pathogen. Susceptibility should only be done on clinically significant isolates, not on all microorganisms. And again, I've already mentioned the importance of labeling accurately so that you can interpret the results. So all of this is really important, really, for the basic microbiology, let alone talking about rapid diagnostics. So let's really bring this down to the bedside. One of the things I love about rounding and teaching is it really grounds you on what's really important, and that's really improving patient care. So let's look at that, this patient uh, that we saw a couple of, couple of years ago, a healthy 34-year-old who presented with dysuria fever, a left flank pain, was febrile, uh, a little bit hypotensive, tachycardic, had left-sided abdominal and flank pain, had a leukocytosis with a left shift, 15% bands. Creatinine had bumped to 1.7. Lactate was a little bit above normal at 2.4. A procalcitonin level was done in the ED, which was 3.4, which you'll show uh, later is clearly elevated. And the urinalysis confirmed what clinically we thought was going on. The patient probably had pyelonephritis. So the first question uh, that you ask yourself Okay, what's the site of the infection? We think it's the kidney. Secondly, what is the most common organism? Then the third thing that you'll ask yourself, what antibiotic would you start empirically? So we're going to ask you to actually vote on this. Uh, so we'll get that on the right-hand side. Uh, no one right answer. A, cephazolin, 
B, ceftriaxone, C, levofloxacin, D, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, and E, gentamicin. So we're going to have that for about 15 seconds, and we'll hopefully get the results. And then we'll go on to the next slide to show you why what you answered should be based on your specific local antibiogram. There's not a one right answer to this particular. Okay. Since there's so many of you on here, it may take the computer a few seconds. To, uh, here we go. So unfortunately, most of you are chicken, and there's no answer here. Uh, but of the ones that did answer, it looks like ceftriaxone seemed to be the most frequent, uh, and then trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. So let's go to the next slide and show you uh, the antibiograms from two different institutions. And this actually was in the last year, so this is sort of recent. So institution A, uh, Cephas Owen's susceptibility was only 82% for E. coli, which is the most common organism, which was the organism in this particular case. Now look at hospital B. Their cefazolin susceptibility is still pretty good. It's 91%. Most people would use susceptibilities of 85 to 90% in guiding empiric antibiotics. Both institutions have high levels of susceptibility to third-generation cephalosporins, and as is common throughout the U.S. and the world, that levofloxacin is a fluoroquinolone and trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole have about a 20 plus percent resistance rate and are really not good agents to use empirically. So if you were in hospital B, cefazolin would have very, been a very reasonable choice. If you were in hospital A, you may have wanted to go to a third generation cephalosporin. So knowing your local antibiogram is very, very helpful in managing these, these cases empirically. Now, what about point of care testing? A new point of care testing is the, the nucleic acid amplification test. So, as many of you know, the old point of care testing revolved around group A strep, which was actually not too bad. The sensitivity and specificity are shown on this particular slide. Uh, the influenza EIA was commonly used in the emergency departments and outpatient centers, and you can see the specificity was not too bad, uh, but as most clinicians know, it only had a 50 to 70% positivity rate. So people were looking for a clear wave uh, point of care test that would improve the sensitivity uh, uh, for influenza in particular. Now, having said that, I, I want, want people to be aware that even when someone came in with influenza and had a positive EIA, if you look at large studies, most of those patients still got an antibacterial rather than an antiviral. So once again, trying to link the clinical, the diagnostic test to an action that's appropriate still is important to optimize stewardship and patient outcomes. So we now have at least two manufacturers now within 20 minutes can do point of care testing for A, B, influenza, RSV, and group A strep with a high degree of sensitivity and specificity. These studies are, are, are more expensive and like anything else, it has to be applied appropriately to the patients in front of you. I can't tell you how many times I've seen an EIA for influenza that's done in July and August uh, in many emergency rooms throughout the United States. And so I think you have to have an index of suspicion the patient has influenza or RSV or group A strep, uh, and then order the test appropriately so that you optimize its value. Otherwise, if you use this test in a low-risk situation, you may get some false positives. So the next topic is talking about biomarkers, and the best biomarker out there uh, is procalcitonin. Uh, procalcitonin is normally produced in thyroid and other glands. It's converted to calcitonin. Normal levels without bacterial infections are less than 0.05. It's stimulated by endotoxins and cytokines. Concentrations of greater than 0.25 may be indicative of a bacterial infection. We'll talk about some false positives and false negatives in a minute. And levels of greater than 2, the higher the level generally uh, correlates with the severity of infection. So it's increase in bacterial infection. It's more specific than other studies like SED rate and CRPs. It's actually inhibited by TNF gamma, which is in the response to viral infection, which is why it's nice 
this is a study that's very nice to differentiate viral versus bacterial. The levels do change in response to bacterial infections. Uh, rapid response to treatment, we'll show you a couple of cases in just a moment. Uh, and it's in general guidelines for sepsis stewardship and HAP and VAP. And it really is very useful in assisting both in starting, but many of the studies actually look at discontinuation in terms of duration based on the kinetics of clearance of procalcitonin. Uh, if you look at large studies, the sensitivity and specificity seem to be very good for respiratory tract infection, sensitivity not quite as good uh, for sepsis. It has a very good negative predictive value. Uh, as I said, the higher the level does kind of correlate with bacterial burden and severity. It's not affected by certain modifying drugs, steroids. Uh, generally, most autoimmune diseases do not cause significant increases in procalcitonin. Uh, and so it's a very nice test to use in that setting. So the next question we want to ask all of you, uh, how long does it take procalcitonin to rise in response to a bacterial infection? So your choices are zero to two hours, three to six hours, six to 12 hours, or 12 to 24 hours. Again, uh, we're not taking, we don't know who's voting, but it's really useful to kind of know exactly what the level of knowledge is in our community about the use of procalcitonin. We've certainly found in a couple of studies that uh, procalcitonin is not always optimally used uh, if there's not good physician education. So we've got the answer right here. Uh, those of you who voted, uh, it appears that between three to six and six to 12 hours uh, may have been the predominant. We still have a bunch of people that are not answering the question, but that's okay. We got a good feel for you. So for those of you who said three to six hours, uh, that would be correct. You can see that you're pretty close to the six to 12 hours. So here's a nice uh, procalcitonin kinetics. It goes in three to six hours. It peaks at 12 to 24 hours. The half-life is generally around 24 hours. Uh, it can take 24 hours of appropriate therapy before you see reduction in procalcitonin. Uh, we generally see a decrease of about 50% per day if the patient's on appropriate antimicrobial therapy. And if it's, they're not on therapy, the levels may not go down or actually may go up. So it's really a nice guide for a variety of reasons. Here's a chart uh, that most people use in terms of how to interpret procalcitonin. You should be using the ultra-sensitive assay. Again, uh, if it's less than 0.1, bacterial infections are unlikely. The 0.1 to 0.25, probably also unlikely. Again, you've got to use your clinical judgment uh, and, and knowing when the bacterial infection started in trying to interpret the results. It should always, the results should enable better decision making, not necessarily drive, drive what decision you make. If you're between 0.25 and 0.5, bacterial infection becomes more likely and certainly greater than 0.5, a bacterial infection is, is much more likely. And again, in considering stopping antibiotics, many people use an 80 to 90% decrease uh, as a guide to stopping uh, therapy. So let's look at two different cases, and I thank Dr. Boyles for providing case number two. And you'll see these are very two similar cases. Uh, and so these are patients who presented with, with uh, probable pyelonephritis, they're febrile, they're not hypotensive, they're their heart rate's sort of borderline in terms of being tachycardic. They both have a leukocytosis with bandemia. Their lactates are just below the upper limits of normal, usually about two or 2.1. They both have slightly elevation of BUN and creatinine compared to their baseline. And both of them have a positive urinalysis consistent with pyelonephritis. So here's patient number one. Their initial procalcitonin level is 4.3, well above that 0.5, and we said the higher the level, perhaps the higher the bacterial burden and severity. Uh, patient number two is 5.9. Patient number one got septriaxone on a gram every 24 hours, and patient number two got levofloxacin at 500 milligrams every 24 hours. And if you look at the antibiograms I showed you before, you may think about whether or not those were appropriate choices based on your local antibiogram. Well, let's take a look at what happened. Well, case number one, which got the 
except trioxone, uh, the, by the end of 24 to 36 hours, in fact, their procalcitonin level actually was coming down. But case number two, positive blood cultures occurred at about 16 to 18 hours, and a repeat procalcitonin level on that patient shot up to 23.4. Uh, in fact, that you might ask the question, well, why did that occur? Was the patient on appropriate therapy? Uh, excuse me, let me go back. It turns out that this particular patient grew an E. coli that was resistant to fluoroquinolones, and based on their antibiogram, very similar to the ones I showed you, they had about a 20% resistance rate uh, to fluoroquinolones. So fluoroquinolones, based on their local antibiogram, wasn't a good choice, and the procalcitonin level, in fact, correlated with inappropriate therapy. You can see once appropriate therapy was instituted, uh, the patient procalcitonin level came down very nicely. So again, this is an example of how procalcitonin level can guide you on whether or not therapy is appropriate, and you can see with appropriate therapy, there is rapid clearance based on the kinetics. And this very nice study published about a year ago, looking at the real world impact of using a procalcitonin guided antimicrobial therapy program in a, in a hospital in Arkansas, you can see that they reduced all cause 30 day readmission rates. So we're looking at patient safety as well. Uh, did we do any harm with using procalcitonin? Second, adverse drug reaction. Remember I told you 20% of patients in the hospital get an adverse drug event. That was reduced. All-cause mortality was reduced, and C. diff infections were reduced because they had duration of therapy was much shorter, uh, they narrowed spectrum, and so procalcitonin improved outcomes and actually improved patient safety if it's used appropriately. Now, there are some false negatives. Remember, it takes, we mentioned it takes several hours for procalcitonin to come up to be significant. So if you get these people very early, uh, sometimes the procalcitonin level may be low. There are certain localized infections, subacute bacterial endocarditis, uh, and organisms like mycoplasma sort of, sort of fit in between, but generally they tend to have low uh, procalcitonin levels. Now, on the false positive side, this is really tricky, especially if you have someone who's a major trauma patient, has had bowel ischemia, pancreatitis, shock of any kind, and I can tell you some of the higher procalcitonin levels I have seen have been patients who have had cardiogenic shock who have significantly over procalcitonin levels and multiple negative cultures. So there are things that can increase uh, procalcitonin that are not infectious. There are certain malignancies, certain medications which are shown on the slide. There are some, quote, non-bacterial pathogens such as malaria and candida. Uh, very important, but they're not bacterial pathogens. And in the face of renal insufficiency, trying to look at procalcitonin is very tricky because it will go up with renal insufficiency. If you do dialysis or CVVHD, you will get some partial clearance of procalcitonin. But procalcitonin in the face of renal insufficiency is a very difficult thing to measure and follow. Well, then let's call, the rest of the time, let's look at rapid diagnostic tests. So this is the right side of this equation. Uh, how do we do the right interpretation, the right time, and link it to stewardship? So the Infectious Disease Society updated their stewardship guidelines, and the two things I've plucked out of there was, uh, should stewardship advocate for the use of rapid viral testing for respiratory pathogens? And they did suggest that would be appropriate to reduce inappropriate antibiotic use. That's not only the point of care testing, uh, but some of the multiplex things I'll show you in a minute. Uh, what about rapid diagnostics for blood cultures? Because that's where a lot of this is being applied uh, across the United States and the world. Uh, certainly suggest it really does add a lot, but as I've emphasized here and I've underlined, it has to be with active antimicrobial stewardship support for interpretation and action. Now, when we talk about rapid diagnostic tests, you're all probably thinking molecular, but there's a number of biomarkers uh, that are shown on this slide that are rapid. You get a white count pretty fast, set rate, CRP, lactate, procalcitonin. The gram stain, which I talked about, Sir so, so, so Graham, back in 1884. And then, of course, most of you think about rapid in, in, in terms of molecular, which we'll, we'll certainly talk about. So the traditional way in which to look at 
uh, molecular versus traditional. So if you have the traditional on the top, you draw your blood cultures. They turn positive. The lab does a gram stain. It reports it out. Uh, antibiotics are generally continued through this process. Uh, you don't get standard identification and susceptibility usually by day, day, day two or three, and then you do targeted therapy after the results come back. With the molecular studies, as soon as the blood culture turns positive, there's a number of multiplex channels you can use to identify the organism and certain mechanisms of resistance. It allows us to have much more targeted therapy much earlier in the course uh, and really improve patient outcomes, and we'll show you an example of that in just a moment. These are the FDA-approved uh, rapid molecular tests from PNA Fish to accelerate. We'll talk about a little bit uh, the PCRs. There's a whole variety of PCRs from uh, the film arrays to C diff. Uh, there's MultiTOF, which is really a wonderful instrument uh, to help, especially with difficult to identify organisms. The multiplex channels, uh, which are uh, very, very useful in a variety of sites. Uh, and then the new T2 system, which uses nuclear magnetic resonance to identify mm -hmm. organisms directly from whole blood. So we used to think about turnaround time, uh, but I think it's much more important to not only talk about turnaround time, but time to intervention. Multiple studies have shown that the shorter it's optimal therapy reduces mortality, length of stays, and cost. But unless it's combined with some sort of stewardship activity, often these results of these studies are not acted upon in a timely manner. So let's talk first about the culture dependence. So something has to grow. We're going to concentrate on, on multi, uh, a little bit about this rapid phenotypic antimicrobial susceptibility testing, uh, some of the NAT detection for selected resistance. So these are the things we'll be talking about. First, let's talk about multi. Uh, there's an investment in the platform for multi, which is a couple of hundred thousand. Once you make that investment, the cost of the reagents, the tech time, the turnaround time is very inexpensive. Uh, you put the organism in, breaks it up, and gives you a specific uh, pattern here shown on the right-hand side uh, that are very specific for organisms. And if you look at how good it is, it's really incredibly how good it is to identify organisms, especially if it's in their database. And in fact, this becomes the go-to uh, platform, for instance, to identify Candida auris, uh, which is a, you know, increasingly number of invasive cases which we're all very nervous about. Uh, it's been very useful for stewardship. It improves the time to effective therapy when it's linked to a stewardship program, reducing length of stays, and reducing mortality. So this has been a very, very useful thing, especially in getting rapid identification of the organism, as well as organisms that may be difficult to identify. Now, we have two uh, rapid identification from positive blood cultures. These are probably some of the most widely used molecular studies. There's the film array and the Veragene. Uh, they both have a number of gram-positive and gram-negative targets. Uh, film array has five uh, yeast targets. Uh, the Veratine has a few more resistance targets. And you can see fairly good accuracy in the range of 90 plus percent. So both of these are very, very useful when that organism turns positive using one of these panels to identify what the organism is and does it have a resistance gene uh, that might impact therapy. So if you look at this very nice study that was published in CID back in 2015, they looked at using this rapid multiplex. Uh, they looked at it with stewardship and without stewardship. And both of them, you can see, if they had the wrong drug or the patient had a resistance gene, you can see how much more rapidly they were able to escalate therapy compared to more traditional methods. What really made an impact was in the de-escalation. You can see even with the rapid multiplex, the middle column there, de-escalation didn't really occur until 36 hours on its own, but if it was linked to stewardship, it was actually de-escalation occurred between 12 to 24 hours. Uh, the film array was able to identify 81% of the organisms, and again, the time to de-escalate was clearly improved with stewardship. And then this later article from the CID in 2017, again, continues to emphasize that decreasing the time to effective therapy 
uh, is linked to having an effective stewardship in place. So it's very important not to just have the technology, but the technology linked to an outcome and an action. When we look at multi versus these multiplex PCRs, uh, multi, I told you, is very fast, it's accurate, it's very inexpensive for tests. It's not that technically complex to run. However, there is the initial cost of the platform I already mentioned, and currently uh, they're not unable to identify resistance genes. The multiplex, of course, uh, if you do the multiplex for blood cultures, it does require a positive blood culture. If you do it to synchromic, which I'll show you a little bit later, uh, and the culture of an organism is not necessarily required. It can be very sensitive and specific. Uh, it does require cycler, a little bit more highly trained laboratory personnel to run it. Uh, and the test is more costly for tests because they're running it against multiple antigens. But both of these complement each other very, very nicely. We have this new uh, rapid phenotypic susceptibility testing called Accelerate, where you actually have a positive blood culture. You actually put it through this machine with electro uh, kinetic concentration. It gives you phenotypically uh, antimicrobial susceptibility uh, that can be turned out uh, in a fairly short period of time. Uh, again, this is another methodology uh, that some laboratories have found very useful. And in terms of the studies, it, it really correlates very well with Vitec 2 identification. You can see that both gram positive and gram negative correlation. Uh, is very high, and the sensitivity level is very high as well. Uh, then we talk about culture-independent tests. So those studies, for the most part, you have to have a positive culture. Uh, there's a direct antigen test. There's a point-of-care testing, which I already mentioned before. And then these syndromic multiplex channels, which I've mentioned. And then this uh, direct detection uh, by the T2 system, which I'll briefly mention uh, at the end. Here are the panels that are currently approved by the FDA. We have respiratory, we now have lower respiratory panels, meningitis, blood culture panels, which I've already talked about, uh, and GI panels. And depending upon how they're used, they can be extremely useful in reducing turnaround time and coming up with the right diagnosis. There are some limitations to PCR. You can get contamination if you're not careful in your laboratory. We separate our molecular lab from microbiology. Uh, there can be some false negatives. Sometimes it can't tell the difference between viable organisms, colonization, and pathogens. Uh, there's some cost issues, and it doesn't do antimicrobial susceptibility testing. Uh, PCR management uh, interpretation is important. We've already talked about the challenges around Clostridioides difficile. I'll come back and talk about a case in a moment. Uh, there's occasional places where the MECA gene for Staph aureus may be present but not expressed, so you don't detect it, but that's pretty uncommon. Knowing what's on the panels and what's not on the panels, knowing which panels to order and when, uh, and will the physician understand how to interpret the test? There are pathogens on some of these panels uh, that physicians may never have heard of. And then there's the T2 biosystem. This is very interesting where you don't have to have growth yet. You take whole blood and directly put it <clears throat> on these panels. You can see these are the escape pathogens for the bacterial panel and the Canada panel on the back. A very recent article actually published online in the Annals of Internal Medicine yesterday uh, show that for the escape pathogens, the T2 bacterial panel perform well. The question, of course, with these, can, these, can this kind of methodology improve outcomes and significantly shorten time to appropriate antimicrobial therapy compared to the use of multiplex PCRs on positive cultures, I think that needs yet to be studied. So let's look at uh, another study, a case study of a, a, an unfortunate woman who had a complex surgical procedure with aortic valve replacement. She had rheumatic fever as a child, a mitral valve repair, and coronary artery bypass. She's a type 2 diabetic. Uh, she had surgery three weeks ago, came back with fever, a purulent drainage from her sternum. Uh, it was unstable. White count was elevated with a left shift. Lactate was up. Creatinine was up compared to her baseline. Blood cultures were drawn, and an ID consult was thought. And this, this is a literally a case 
on a Sunday afternoon when I was coming through the emergency department, and the ED physician said, you're probably going to get consulted on this patient, so why don't you come and see it? Uh, so the question is, a rapid diagnostic test was performed on this patient. Was it A, PCR, B, a gram stain, C, a sed rate, D, a T2 bacterial panel? So let's weigh in on this and tell me what rapid diagnostic test do you think was performed on this patient on Sunday afternoon? Okay, once again, the number one is no answer. Uh, those people that, that did answer, it looks like the plurality of you felt that a gram stain was done. So let's take a look at it. Well, I'm sort of an old-fashioned ID doc, and so I actually did a, uh, I got a slide. I streaked out the pus on the slide. I went up to microbiology, uh, did the gram stain myself, and it's that gram-positive cocci in clusters. Now, given the operation this patient had and the fact she was a diabetic, I felt fairly sure the pathogen was staph aureus. So rather than give empiric vancomycin and cefepime or vancomycin and zosin, uh, which I call no uh I decided to only be specific for staph aureus. And so I started initially vancomycin because I did not know if it was MRSA or MSSA. At 12 hours, the laboratory confirmed it was staph aureus. The patient was taken to surgery, uh, and the patient had actually a vegetation on her aortic valve. So in this particular case, the traditional test, the gram stain would have been done, as I mentioned. 24 hours we knew it was staph aureus. Susceptibilities would have taken another 24 hours. And so at 48 hours, we would have known the patient had actually MSSA, which was her pathogen. By rapid diagnostics, we had just had the multi-platform in place, so we put it on multi. We also had uh, one of these multiplex channels from positive blood cultures. So we did that, and we found out that, in fact, it did not have the MECA gene, so we thought it was MSSA. So the question is, what do you do now? Do you continue vancomycin? We know vancomycin certainly covers MSSA and MRSA. Do we switch to a beta-lactam, or do we continue vancomycin and add a beta-lactam? So this is at 12 hours now, 12 to 16 hours. So what would be your choice in this particular patient? See if we can get more to your vote here. Ah, good. So it looks like clearly the majority of you would have switched to a beta-lactam, and that's the right choice. In fact, if you look at study after study, including this one in particular, in fact, that beta-lactams clearly are much better drugs against staph aureus and vancomycin, and it improves patient outcomes, and the sooner you change to a beta-lactam, the better the patient outcome. So instead of changing it at 48 to 72 hours to a beta-lactam, we were able to do this at 16 hours. So here's where it really helps. So the last case I want to show you is this 45-year-old 40, alcoholic who had cirrhosis, came in a febrile, Blood pressure pretty standard for him, had ascites but no tenderness, had asterixis, had spider angiomata, white count was only 12,000, platelet count 78,000, creatinine had gone up significantly, so this patient looked like maybe he had a paterenal syndrome. Patient had continued to drink, you can see the ALT, AST looks very like alcoholic hepatitis, the INR was significantly prolonged, albumin was low, had a significantly high ammonia level. And the chest x-ray really had more vascular markings, not pneumonia. But because of increasing fluid overload and hypoxia, the patient was intubated, was put on hemodialysis, was put on lactulose. Day three had a little fever, but white count really wasn't changed significantly. Increasing infiltrates on chest x-ray are intensivists. Uh, very quick to use cefepime here. And on day five, uh, a stool culture was, uh, excuse me, a stool was sent for Clostridium difficile. And in our laboratory, uh, we are a straight PCR shop. And so the patient on day five was positive by PCR, but the patient was on lactulose. So the question is, does this patient have C. diff or is this patient colonized? And in fact, it's unanswerable. We decided to treat the patient because they were so immunosuppressed uh, but to be honest with you, I don't know if the patient had true C. diff or not. And so to look at Clostridioides testing from the IDSA guidelines, 
molecular tests should only be used when hospitals have criteria <coughs> for sending specimen, and when criteria don't exist, the guidelines should have a two or three step process. And I want to show you a couple of uh, studies here that highlight the importance that patients who have cytotoxic, the old cytotoxic culture, these are people that are toxin producers, that mortality directly correlates if they're toxin producers. For instance, if they're NAD positive by PCR, but they're not producing toxin, they don't look any different than if all their tests were negative. So then the next question you could ask, well, what if I did a GDH and did an EIA in patients who are PCR positive? So maybe they don't, are not producing toxin. In fact, they are at lower risk for having severe disease and lower risk for having occurrences, but you can see that even if they're EIA negative, almost 20% of these people can have severe disease and 7% can have recurrences. So we really don't have perfect testing uh, for making the diagnosis of Clostridium difficile. So here's one of those situations where the molecular has made the diagnosis a little bit more challenging. So I want to end by, by saying that the new diagnostic tests should be evaluated whether they are value added. Uh, do they detect certain resistance mechanisms that affect our choices of therapy? We need to collaborate with clinicians up front. We need to communicate stewardship, rapid diagnostics, and improve processes. And while becoming widely available, remember these tests are more costly. So unless we can link this to stewardship and provide value added, we're not likely to get support from our C-suite. Uh, will the clinician understand the results? Will they act promptly when the results become available? And again, that partnership I've tried to emphasize on this webinar between clinical microbiology and the stewardship team, and I, I want to emphasize nursing is critical to success. So the key takeaways to me is appropriate indications, specimen collections, still important, even in the era of these new diagnostic tests. As you can tell that no one rapid diagnostic platform may meet all needs. I think you should select your platform based on your workflow and your patient population. I think rapid diagnostics can decrease diagnostic uncertainty, which will hopefully decrease unnecessary antimicrobial use and the use of integration of things like biomarker and, P and, and procalcitonin clearance hopefully will decrease duration. Again, to be effective, it has to be linked to stewardship. You need to monitor for unintended consequences. And testing, again, I can't emphasize, has to be correlated with the overall clinical condition of the patient. And with that, I'll end, and we'll uh, see whether we have any open questions. I hope that this provide you for a good overview and a balance between basic microbiology and some of the new wonderful diagnostic tests that are available today. Thank you. Dr. Septimus, thank you so much for that overview. Uh, we've got several questions in, and some of them are in kind of themes here. Picking up on the two predominant themes are related to the field of uh, of the outpatient setting, uh, which is one, and then several questions around uh, procalcitonin as well. So the, with the procalcitonin question relates to some of the protocols and, and algorithms that you currently use, and um, talking about your antimicrobial stewardship team, what, with that protocol and in ordering procalcitonin, how is that usually driven? Is it by the antimicrobial stewardship team or the ordering uh, physician? Uh, well, it, it starts with the antimicrobial stewardship team uh, and being able to drive education down to the clinician level to make sure that procalcitonin is used appropriately, interpreted appropriately. Uh, we, have, we have some clinicians, for instance, who are ordering procalcitonin every day, uh, and that's in most situations not necessary. Uh, we had some people who got repeatedly negative procalcitonin levels for patients with exacerbations of COPD who ignored the results because there's very good studies to show that if you have repeatedly negative procal uh, in exacerbations of COPD, this is unlikely to be bacterial. So it really has to do with education. Uh, if you have some mechanism in your IT system uh, to help alert individuals 
in the stewardship team about results of procalcitonin, and that's helpful, it depends upon the size and complexity of your institution. But I think education is key before you roll out procalcitonin so the clinicians know how to interpret it uh, and how to use it optimally. Uh, a specific question related to data or studies that you're aware of for using post-calcitonin in chronic lung infections. Such oh, as, there are, there are yeah. multiple studies about, again, most of them are around the area of exacerbation of COPD, uh, yeah. which we knew many of those can be viral and not bacterial. And there's really very, I think, very robust data that procalcitonins uh, repeatedly negative procalcitonin in the face of exacerbations of COPD uh, does not require an antibiotic uh, and does not impact patient, does not impact patient safety. Uh, I'm, I'm very comfortable with that. Also related, to, uh, a follow-on question to that was procalcitonin uh, levels only being obtained for respiratory or sepsis infections. Do you also uh, look for procalcitonin increased levels in other types of infections, and they wanted some guidance on if there's resistance to that. Well, I think, again, that you have to look at the patient first. Uh, we certainly use procalcitonin uh, in a number of settings, some for clearance. We have patients who have sepsis, let's say intra-abdominal sepsis, and a uh, patient gets a baseline procalcitonin level, and we follow the kinetics and clearance of procalcitonin to assure uh, the surgeons that uh, their duration of therapy can be shortened based on the kinetics of procalcitonin. So it, it's used in a whole variety of settings. I've also used it occasionally in the febrile ICU patient uh, where I, I really don't think the patient has an infection. <clears throat> um, and I, I've sometimes gotten a procalcitonin level. And if it comes back negative, I feel, I feel assured that I don't have to start antibiotics. So, you always have to correlate the patient to the test uh, and use it to where you think it may be uh, an enabler of making better decisions. Yeah. So switching gears here for the last few minutes, um, and maybe we can come back to some of these procalcitonin questions because there's quite a few, which you've helped to answer some of them, uh, relates to the outpatient setting, using rapid diagnostics in the outpatient setting, um, Retesting urine when there's a, an infection and they've been treated with an antibiotic, do you have some guidance on the outpatient setting in rapid diagnostics? Yeah, that's a great, great question. You know, some of these new point of care uh, nucleic acid tests uh, are more expensive. Uh, they give more, I think, diagnostic certainty, especially in the area of influenza. So if you have a, a big adult in pediatric practice that might might be useful. Again, make sure you use it when you have influenza and not during the summer <clears throat> if you're in the northern hemisphere. Uh, in terms of urines, in general, uh, if you have a, a woman who's got simple cystitis, um, we generally don't even suggest getting urine cultures the first go around. It's only if they come back either not responding or they have an early recurrence. In, in general, we don't do follow-up urines for clearance uh, unless it's a very unusual case. Okay. With related to C. difficile, another question related to that is just trying to determine whether the patient's colonized with C. difficile or not, and I think you, you highlighted that in your presentation but wanting to maybe clarify that a little bit, of your strategy of te rapid testing for that? Sure, appreciate the question. <clears throat> if you look at studies before PCR became available, we know that the average patient who comes into the hospital when tested for C. diff <laughs> have less than a 5% chance, and we're not talking about infants, it's a different population, have less than a 5% <clears throat> incidence of having uh, being positive for C. diff. After they've been hospitalized, that goes up to 15 plus percent. And we're not talking about disease, we're just talking if you routinely test them for Clostridium or Clostridioides uh, difficile. With the EIA test, that was the most commonly available test, 
depending upon the, the assay you use, the sensitivity level, and most clinicians knew this, was in the range of around 60 to 80 percent, but a pretty good specificity case. And so patients would often get treated whether or not they were EIA positive or negative if the physician felt they had clostridioides infection. <clears throat> With PCR, as I've already mentioned, we increase the sensitivity, but we reduce the specificity. And then we found out how these assays were being used, and in multiple studies and healthcare systems, uh, often patients were getting stool sent to the laboratory who had been on laxatives in the prior 48 hours and really didn't have abdominal pain, they really didn't have leukocytosis or other clinical signs or symptoms. And that's why I mentioned the importance, I hate use the word stool stewardship, becomes so important. Now, there's the two-step, which the Europeans like, which is GDH, reflex to EIA, uh, and maybe reflex to PCR if the EIA is negative, uh, is one of the more preferred assays in Europe. Uh, in the U.S., it's about a 50-50 split. <clears throat> uh, but if you do have PCR only, which is what the IDSA guidelines talk about, you have to have a way to make sure that appropriate stool specimens are sent not patients who are on laxatives. And now there are some people, uh, because of I showed you the data, that if you're EIA negative, even if you're PCR positive, that you're less likely to have disease. And if you have disease, it tends to not be as severe. But as I showed you in that one study, unfortunately, <clears throat> some people do have severe disease and some of them have recurrence. So I think we, we have to figure out what the optimal diagnostic algorithm to use but one of the things we can certainly improve is making sure that patients who are in laxes or lactulose, like the patient that I mentioned, uh, who don't have other clinical signs and symptoms, uh, stools not be sent. 